Hello, welcome to this month's Think Beyond IP LinkedIn Live. You know, I usually, if you've joined me before, I usually say I have these every last Wednesday of the month at noon Eastern, and you will notice that we are not at noon Eastern. Record your message. And part of the reason is because of the technical difficulties that I had uh, without uh, last time. So I apologize for that. But from now on, we're going to be doing these the last Wednesday of the month at 1030 a.m. And I hope this time works for uh, most of you. And uh, also, I may throw in some extra LinkedIn lives like I did a couple of weeks ago when there is a topical subject that I feel just can't wait to the end of the month. And so with that, I want to welcome my good friend and colleague, Erica Holthausen. Erica, welcome to Think Beyond IP's LinkedIn Live. Thank you so much, Erin. I'm really excited to talk about this topic because you are the brains on this topic and I just have the experience from the other side. So it'll be great to dig in. It will be fantastic. So for those of you who don't know Erica, Erica is the thought partner to establish consultants who wish to build their authority as industry leaders by writing articles for publications like Inc., Entrepreneur, and Harvard Business Review. So Erica, tell us a little bit about how you got into this business. Well, I've been a freelance writer and freelance editor for over 20 years, often on the side of my primary job. And when I started my business, I had been doing content marketing, which I wasn't really all that interested in doing, but had a great client who happened to have a great pair between him and an editor friend of mine at a trade journal. And I loved everything about that project. So decided, okay, this is even more fun teaching experts how to write and pitch articles so that they can build their authority. So I still get to be in that writing world, which is where my heart is. And yeah, and I get to be, I often say I am the AJ McInerney to your Andrew Shepard. I get to be the gal behind the scene who helps like make those things work. And that is delightful to me. Yeah, I noticed that you left out the retired or recovering lawyer. What is <laughs> Reco Yeah, I am a recovering attorney. Um, I was in, and that'll come up because part of what we're talking about is is like reading contracts and signing contracts and mm -hmm. all of that stuff. And I will say, as a recovering attorney, I have also made the mistake of not bothering to read the contract and just signing the bloody thing. So... <laughs> Part yeah. of what we're talking about today is why that's not such a great idea. <laughs> exactly, exactly. Well, speaking of the topic, uh, we're here to talk about copyright transfer agreements. Um, also, I call them copyright assignments. Um, and uh, when you are writing for publications, the, the uh, documents that they ask you to sign and uh, how to do that while still protecting your intellectual property. So as you know, oh, I want to just say, speaking of technical issues, that please put your questions in the chat as soon as they occur to you. Although we are streaming live, that does not mean that this is an instantaneous uh, transmission of information. And so there is a delay um, between when you enter your questions and when they get to us. Um, and so, but in the event that we don't get to your question before we're done, then we will absolutely uh, answer them in the comments to the show. And the show is recorded and you can uh, see a recording of it from my LinkedIn page and, and probably Erica's too, hopefully. <laughs> 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 All right, so let's get to uh, protecting our intellectual property. As you know, the drum that I beat daily is that it is essential to own and control intellectual property if you want to build a scalable expertise-based business. If you want to have something to sell that's not your time, then you have to have some sort of asset. And what are assets when you're an expert? They are intellectual. And in particular, I talk about copyrights. There are other types of intellectual property, but I focus on copyrights because copyrights or cover the tools that you use to create value for your clients. You know, we love our trademarks. I'm a big fan of mine, but the trademark doesn't provide 
create value for your clients, the, the work that you provide to them, your systems, your programs, your trainings, those are the things that provide value to your clients. And those are the things that we protect with copyrights. So today we're going to talk about what happens to your intellectual property uh, when you write for high visibility publications. So with that, uh, I am going to turn it over to Erica about why it's so important to do it. And then we'll talk about some of the legal issues. Yeah. So one of the things that I very firmly believe is that your perspective is your differentiator, but it can only work as a differentiator if you are actually sharing your perspective, which is why many of us are on LinkedIn, why people write books, why people write articles for high visibility publications. It's to get all of that information out there and to show people how we think, what our ideas are, and give them a reason to choose us over a colleague or a peer. Um, so that's a big part of it. But then as I was working with, with one of my clients, she was like, but aren't I just giving away my intellectual property by writing articles for publication? And I was like, Hmm. So that's, that's where, you know, so many of our conversations, Aaron, have kind of been about how do you parse that out? And what does copyright really mean? What does it actually protect? What doesn't it protect? Why is it that it's completely okay to share this information and you're not losing control unless you lose control, which is that signing that agreement without, without really understanding it? Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, I mean, copyrights, uh, you know, lots of materials about this, but just briefly, what copyright protects? It protects the expression of the of an idea in, uh, in tangible form. So the way that it is expressed. So when you write it, the way you write about it. So the written word, if you record a podcast, it, it protects the podcast as recorded. If you paint a painting, if you, uh, you know, sculpt a sculpture, you know, so it is the tangible form that, uh, that expression that is covered by copyright, but the underlying idea itself cannot be protected. Ideas are not protectable. And so I like to use the example of kind of my, um, you know, my idea that, you know, uh, uh, intellectual property is a prerequisite to creating a scalable business. And so anyone can take that idea, right? I can't protect that. But the way I talk about it, the way I write about it, that is protectable. And so when we look at, you know, writing, um, we have the idea, which we want to get out there everywhere. The more I the more people who get access to our ideas, uh, and the more we develop and refine them, um, the more we cross over to the we call thought leader, right? What is the term that you use? Authoritative expert. Authoritative expert. There we go. <laughs> thought expert. leader also works. I'm just more conventionally <laughs> about it. <laughs> yeah. But we do not want people taking our content and using it as their own. So yeah. that is yours to protect. So and I think the thing, the thing about that is it's so mind blowing to be like, wait a minute, the article is protected, but the ideas behind it are not. And that's, that's such a nuanced mm -hmm. distinction right. that because we often talk about and people often are worried about, well, I, you know, I don't want anybody to steal my ideas. Well, they're going to um, <laughs> like every idea has a lineage. It, it builds upon something else. So it's coming from someplace. So that that really nuanced distinction, I think, can really get folks a, a little freaked out because it's like, oh, that's it just it protects this, but it doesn't protect this other piece. One of the things that helped me when we were first talking about this is you have talked about copyrights as a bundle of rights. Can you talk a little bit about like what's in that bundle and why it's a bundle? Because you can like, yes, take, pick it apart and it still is there. So that would be yeah. great too. Oh, what a great question. Yeah. So copyright 
Exactly. It protects a bundle of rights. And basically, it means that when you have a work that is eligible for copyright protection, that you have, as the owner of that copyright, you have exclusive rights to exploit a number of ways to um, you know, exploit that work. So those include the right to make copies, the right to distribute it, the right to license it to third parties, the right to make make derivatives from it. And so all of those rights can be owned as a whole or they can be split up. And so we're going to talk about how we can split them up when we share them with a publication. But for instance, let's take a book like um, the, uh, one that's still under, under everyone I'm thinking of is, is in <laughs> public domain. So uh, a book I just read, which was, I can't remember now. Slow Productivity by Cal Thank Newport. I we'll pop that it. in. Thank you. Thank you. And, uh, and so, the author of that book owns the copyright of it, but he would have given rights to his publisher to distribute it, to make copies of it and to distribute it, but he still owned the copyright in it. Another, let's say though, there was a motion picture. <laughs> I, mean, I was trying to think of a novel. <laughs> let's say there's a motion picture that's made out of slow productivity. And, uh, and so that, he would actually sell the right, the copyright, that right to make a derivative work based on his book to the motion picture company. So they would own the copyright in that derivative. He would not own the copyright in that derivative. So you can both license some part of that bundle of rights or you can sell some or all of that bundle of rights. And in the article world, for the most part, when we are writing as experts to build our authority and gain visibility, we are not getting paid any money to do this, to do this writing. We are being compensated in other ways, usually with access to a specific audience and being able to get our ideas out there and the social proof that comes from writing for one of these publications, but it's not a financial agreement. So then it also becomes, okay, you're not, you're not selling your rights in the traditional sense. It's a different type of compensation. But then there's some publications do ask you to sign a copyright transfer agreement. Others don't. Mm -hmm. And then it becomes, you know, figuring out, okay, which ones do, which don't. Is that something that I want to is that something that I even want to do? Um, I was asked yesterday, like, why would you ever? sign a copyright transfer agreement. And the first thing that came to mind, and Erin, you were just talking about, you know, the, that bundle of rights and being able to distribute is one of those bundles. Well, if you sign a copyright transfer agreement that allows the publication to distribute it, that's how you get into publications, especially that are specific for subscribers or for members of an association. A lot of membership associations will have sort of their online stuff that might not be gated at all. So anybody can access that. They're probably not going to have you sign a transfer of copyrights agreements, but then they'll also have either a gated section or a print publication mm -hmm. where they will ask for some of your rights to be transferred to them because part of the point of membership, one of the benefits of membership is getting access to this thing. If you can access that thing anywhere on the internet, then it's not really a very strong benefit. Yeah. Yeah. And I just want to make the point when we use the terms like such sell or transfer, I mean, that can apply to either a license or an assignment. And just, again, the difference would be, am I retaining ownership in the copyright, whether in whole or in part, and providing permission to the publication to use it in the way that is delineated in that license agreement? That's a license. And versus am I actually selling them the copyright for that particular work? And, uh, and we have seen, you know, some uh, 
uh, organizations who do require the ownership of that, as, as Erica mentioned. And um, I guess the trick in that, you know, when people sell the copyright in the article, have you found that they then feel like they can't write about that subject anymore? Like, like you know, I mean, obviously they still have their expertise, they're still using it in other ways. But if I were to say, write an article about, um, you know, AI and the copyrightability of AI, and I sold that article to a publication, like, could I still write other articles about copyrights and AI? Yeah, and that goes back to that thing between like, what is the tangible thing mm -hmm. and the idea? Mm -hmm. So yes, you can still write about that. There, there are always about, you know, any topic under the sun, there are about a bajillion ways that you can approach it, that you can either add some nuance or you can take it from a slightly different direction. Those are different ways of writing about the same thing in different ways. Right. So it's, you know, the bigger thing that I see happen often is when people are asked to sign this, you know, transfer of copyright agreement, they sign it without reading it. And are just like, oh, this is something I am required to do. They think it is a, I am required to sign it exactly as it is written mm -hmm. in order to get this piece published. So they don't necessarily read the piece and don't right. understand what it is. And sometimes folks will get really upset with the editor and think that it's like a bait and switch. But in my experience, most of the time, that is not the case. Most of the time, the editor is acting in good faith. They are sending this out because it's what they do. And they haven't read it right. any more than you have. So it's often not meant to be a bait and switch. It's just what they are supposed to do because it's what their publication requires. So then it's really also educating yourself about what's actually in that contract and educating them to go back and forth to make sure that it actually works. Because usually the practice and, you know, the, the practice of the publication and the rights that you actually sign over are usually not the same. They're usually not right. aligned. They end right. up asking for way more rights than they actually intend to use for various right. reasons. <laughs> right. Well, I think we have time to look at a couple of examples. And so bear with me while I try to pull up a slide <laughs> and, uh, and not mess anything up. But I think uh, we have, let's see here. Yeah, this is the right one. So here is an example of one of the more aggressive um, provisions. And, and so basically it asks for the publisher to get all rights, including the copyright. So this would be an assignment. This is not a license. This is an assignment of the copyright in the work to the publisher. And it also grants the publisher the right to not just distribute and display the work, but also to create derivatives of it. Um, and I think that goes to Erica's point, like, is the publisher really going to create derivatives of this work? I mean, it's, you know, what, what, you know, in your experience, uh, has a distributor ever really kind of taken something and created a derivative? From it? Well, it, here's the weird thing, right? What they mean by that and what we read that as are very different things. So what they mean by that is I, we have the right to create a shorter post that we can mm -hmm. put on social media to draw attention to this work. So yeah. it's, it's one of those, those weird things or sometimes it will show up first like this this happened a lot in the freelance writing world you would have a piece that's published in this issue of the magazine but then they ca they create another like a special issue of a magazine and it also shows up in there so that's you don't get mm -hmm. you know they get to do that because that's a derivative work Right. That's interesting because, you know, the example that I gave of what a derivative work could be, you know, making a motion picture from a book is included in, in derivative rights. Yeah. And so this is a very broad grant, which is but is intended for a fairly narrow use. And so yeah. that would be a reason to to make sure you're reading that. Yeah. Well, and it, oftentimes it, sure. it won't say anything about 
they'll say what you're transferring, but they won't say anything about you will always be credited as the author. Mm -hmm. So if you wholesale transfer all of your copyrights to anybody, they can change it however their little hearts desire and they can slap anybody's name on the top. So that's that's where it becomes, you know, you're doing this to build your authority and your reputation. That's where it becomes absolutely essential that your name is always affiliated with this work as it is published once, you know, everybody has agreed on whatever edits need to be made. Yeah, I mean, that's important. I mean, the, the you're not getting paid for it. So there's this thing called consideration when you have contracts. So if I'm going to uh, transfer something to you to perform a service for you, I am giving you value. The, you have to give me something back, you know, that provides value. That's consideration. And if I give you a work and then I don't get paid, I don't get credit for it. Like, where's the value? What's the consideration that's coming back to me? And so make sure that you are getting paid, you know, whether in credit, attribute, whatever it is, you want to make sure you're getting value back from that publication. Thank you. That's such an interesting point because I hadn't thought about it that way. Mm -hmm. And that was like, so I, I used to do a lot of ghost writing. And in that case, I would be paid for the piece and I'd give up all of my copyrights because that's what I was paid to do mm -hmm. was to write the piece in somebody else's name. And then somebody else's name would be slapped on there and Bob's your uncle. In those cases, I was always paid for that. Mm -hmm. In in this case, when you're writing for building your authority and visibility, you're not getting compensated financially, but you are getting in front of different audiences. A lot of the times they are not, the publications that don't have something that basically says you will always be credited, they don't necessarily really know the ins and outs of copyright law. Right. So it's one of those things that that's where I would go back and negotiate and say, this needs to, like, I can't sign this if it mm -hmm. does not say that right. this is what's going to happen. So right. you can always work with the publisher and figure out what, what makes sense there. But yeah, that's another, that's another interesting piece. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, just the experience negotiating agreements, people are not going to object to reasonable requests for changes. It hundred percent makes sense. And again, the editor who was tasked with just, you know, handing the paperwork to you, maybe has never read it, doesn't realize that it doesn't say that you aren't going to get any credit and you're just giving your work away for free. Yeah. Um, so yeah. So, so don't be afraid to, uh, ask for reasonable requests. All right, so here's another example that I think is uh, much fairer. And uh, and so this one, it is in fact a license. So um, it, it this would have referred, I don't have the whole thing here, but the author retains the copyright, uh, including the rights to reproduce, distribute, perform, display, those are uh, copyright, uh, the part of the bundle of copyrights, um, prepare derivative works and authorize others to do it. Now they are requesting that they not do it for commercial purposes. Um, so they're placing some restrictions on how they can exercise uh, the retained uh, rights. But, um, you know, assuming they've been paid for this article, we're going to make that assumption. Um, it is reasonable for them to not expect them not to sell it to uh, another periodical. So, yeah. Yeah. Would you talk for a minute, Erin, about what happens? Because a lot of publications don't actually ask for a copyright transfer agreement. What does that mean? <laughs> yeah. So let's say, yeah. So whether it was... Um, written on spec or commissioned not even for pay I, i'm yeah. talking specifically for for writing for visibility and it's just okay i'm an expert i'm going to write this article and it's going to be published by you know trade journal yeah. business magazine whatever and they don't ask me to sign anything yeah by the way this answer flies whether they get paid or not so so you know for what no matter the circumstances <laughs> uh if if you do not have something in writing with the publisher, the human being, the default under copyright law is that the human being who 
uh, created the work is the copyright owner, period, full stop. Um, you cannot have a transfer of ownership of copyright or ownership of exclusive um, use, exclusive, exclusive license, without it being in writing and signed by the human who created it. And so if there is nothing in writing between you and the publisher, you own the work and uh, they have a non-exclusive license to use it. And that would apply even if they paid for it and they commissioned it and paid for it. If it's not in, if, if there's not a written agreement, um, they only have a non-exclusive license to use it. Yeah. And this is where another little nuance comes in because a lot of the publications that don't have you sign anything, many will say, we would like to have this exclusive on our website for a period of time. So that becomes my understanding is, and, and correct me if I'm just making stuff up because it's possible, but my understanding is that's just, that's a request. That's you doing them a favor. If you abide by that and say, okay, you know, that's doing them a favor because they don't have, you haven't legally transferred to them a limited exclusive period. Right. So, they have yeah. not received an exclusive license to use it even for whatever the limited period is, unless it's in writing. That's yeah. Correct. And so that's part of why a lot of publications, they will, you know, if you write for them and, and the article appears, they'll say, oh, 10 to 14 days exclusive here, and then you can syndicate it. Um, you know, I think they think that is a little bit more like legally binding than it actually mm -hmm. is, mm -hmm. but <laughs> that's a fairly common practice and it, it allows you to take whatever you have written and also put it up on your blog, put it on LinkedIn, put it on other platforms. So they send just a note after it's published, just telling you or how does that? Or... Sometimes. Okay. <laughs> uh, often, well, by the way. <laughs> often, no, like sometimes it might be in, in their guidelines. Um, mm. sometimes they say absolutely nothing about it. And then you mm. might ask and say, you know, am I permitted to syndicate this? Right. Mm -hmm. Um, you know, the answer is yes, because you didn't say no, but then, then it occurs, oh, I should probably say what the guidelines are. So sometimes it appears like in their, in their editorial guidelines and it's like, mm -hmm. okay, this is, this is mm -hmm. what you're agreeing to. Mm -hmm. Um, but right. it's not actually what you're agreeing to. It's just what they would like. <laughs> right. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I guess that could come down to whether or not like agreeing to the editorial guidelines creates a, a an exclusive license. And uh, that is a good question. I mean, uh, at this time, um, you know, it has to be in writing and signed and and it's the signed it part it, that usually yeah. doesn't happen. So yeah. they don't have anything that it's like, you have to sign yeah. this. It's just, yeah. here are our guidelines. And yeah, exactly. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. But, um, you know, I, I, I almost hate to like put as a practical matter things out there, out there, but I will. <laughs> dangerous, dangerous territory. But as a practical <laughs> matter, you know, generally those rules regarding transfer of ownership or exclusive license isn't for a 14 day license, frankly, you mm -hmm. know, cause there's not, it's not like you're, um, so there as a practical matter, <laughs> you may want to be, you know, be reasonable, um, just as a relationship piece. Yeah. Just, you know, you know. That's what I was going to say. And as a practical <laughs> matter, your relationship with this publication right. matters. If you want to keep writing for them, right. you know, being able to say, Oh, sure. Of course it'll be exclusive here. It's 10 days. Right. Exactly. We're fine. Um. <laughs> right. Yeah. So, uh, yes, Rachel asked if the recording will be available. And uh, yes, it will be. Um, it's all recordings are always posted on my profile and um, on LinkedIn. And uh, and then Erica will be free to share it as well. So yeah, I'll figure out how to do that and make it, <laughs> make it accessible on mine as well. <laughs> Absolutely. Uh, so let's wrap up. We're at the end of our time. So what are your big takeaways from the conversation? I think, you know, the biggest takeaway is obviously read the, read the agreement before you sign it, understand mm -hmm. it. But similarly, assume good faith. Assume that your editor is operating in good faith and that they will be able to 
help you understand what's going on there and understand what their practices are. They are probably, are there shifty people who do a bait and switch? Of course. Most editors at most reputable publications are not those shifty people. They've already invested time, energy, and effort in in you and getting the article to that place. Like they're probably doing this as a as a they probably have no idea what the bloody paperwork says. So by bringing it to their attention, it's also allowing them and the entire team at that publication to take another look at their transfer of, of um, copyright agreement because most of those, if they do have a date on them, most of them are from what my nephew would call the late 1900s. Um, so the 1990s. So they're, they're, they're dated. They've just been using the same thing for a million years and probably haven't looked at it in a while. Yeah, absolutely. And you can do them a favor by pointing stuff out. Absolutely. Yeah. I mean, I will find things that have, you know, lurking in agreements that no one noticed for years as well. So, so don't be afraid. Yeah, my, my, I would add on to what Erica said that I uh, do not be afraid to have those conversations. You're not going to become, you know, the priority prior of the publishing business because you've made some reasonable requests. Uh, everyone understands the value of intellectual property. That's the business that they're in. That's the business that you're in. This is not, you know, you, you're not subservient to them or below them. You are partners in creating value for their audience. And so make sure that you approach it in that way. So, yeah, I love that. Well, thank you all for joining us this week. Uh, if you have any questions or, you know, we watch the, uh, replay and have any questions, don't hesitate to uh, reach out to me or to Erica. Erica, where can people find you? Uh, well, LinkedIn is easy <laughs> and obvious because we're already here. Um, but also catchlinecommunications.com is my website and you can email me, direct message me on LinkedIn, whatever works best. That's fantastic. Well, thank you so much. Until next time.